A lot of people have questions, and I know I had questions at one time. Um, is this the right? Is this the right time? Is this the right moment? Um, if this law passes in Tennessee, SB twelve thirty six, if this heartbeat bill passes, will it pass the test of Roe? Will it make it to the Supreme Court? Will it be ruled unconstitutional? Heard the argument that if it's ruled unconstitutional, then Tennessee could potentially be on the hook for millions of dollars of defending an unconstitutional law, so why bother? Um, we feel very strongly that now is the time, and we're here with David Fowler, our founder and president of the Family Action Council of Tennessee, and he'll be addressing the, ten the Tennessee Senate Judiciary Committee on this issue, and uh, so I just, I want, to, I want to ask David some questions and I want to give him an opportunity um, to help us all understand why now is the right time to uh, to fight this fight and to pass this bill and uh, and to protect life. So, um, Dave, I'll let you kind of take a crack uh, at it. Well, thanks uh, to, to the to the folks that may be asking why should I care what you have to say. Uh, <laughs> the, the answer in part is you need to appreciate that I am a lawyer. Uh, for some people, that'll immediately cause you to turn off the switch, but. But I'm not just speaking here as a layman, but as a person who studied the law, who's worked in this area for, uh, since I got out of law school in 1983. And, and, and you've really asked an excellent question. And uh, I think there's a lot of confusion around this and the heartbeat bill. We, we assume that uh, all heartbeat bills are essentially the same. They're heartbeat bills. Right. And, and they're not. And so um, I would agree with those who are concerned that uh, a wrong strategy, a, a wrong bill, supported in the wrong way, is is a waste of time and not good. Because people have noted North Dakota passed a heartbeat bill, Arizona passed a heartbeat bill, right. and those were struck down by the Eighth Circuit, and that's right. the argument. Right, that's right, that's right. And so the question is, um, why is this going to be any different? And I think that there are differences, and people have to appreciate those differences, and you won't appreciate them if you don't really know something about the law, and most people don't. And so it, it becomes just a messy thing. And like I say, heartbeat bills are heartbeat bills, but not all heartbeat bills are the same. Right. And we have to understand that the House version of the heartbeat bill is not one I supported. I wouldn't support it. I think the attorneys that say it's, it's a bad strategy at the wrong time are absolutely right. But the Senate bill is completely different and grounded in a different um, constitutional basis so it needs to stand on its own and is, and is really, Gary, people need to appreciate, unique from all the heartbeat bills yes. that have ever been passed before. Right. Okay, so, so that needs to, to be made clear. Uh, and I want us to talk today about what those differences are and why those differences are so fundamental and, and uh, critical to understand. But, but I also want to say one other thing, the, the question of timing. And, and when, when do we do something? And you know, I think, I think we need to be careful of, of two things. One is being presumptuous. We're just going to go out and do something. We don't know whether it's right or it's the best thing to do. Uh, we're just going to do it and trust God. Well, that's sort of borders on tempting God. Right. You know, the flip side is, oh, the giants are in the land and, and they're big and we, we'd be better off just staying where we are and not risking being slaughtered or who's going to go out and throw, take on Goliath. So there are points where you have to say, when, when do we go out and say to the giant, you uncircumcised Philistine, who are you? Yeah. Uh, to say, who are you, uh, the giants in the land, before the Lord God Almighty? And can we, and can we camp there for a minute yeah. on, on, the, on the readiness of the court? Because, you know, we, we've had some conversation mm -hmm. and you've put out some great points that throughout the years, the, the court has left a, a fairly decent trail of breadcrumbs to acknowledge the fact right. that they... They have been thinking about this issue, and I, I know there's a there's a quote from an opinion Justice Kennedy wrote 2007 decision the, in the Gonzalez decision, referring back to Casey, saying that a central premise of the opinion was that the court's precedents after Roe had undervalued the state's interest in potential life. Now that to me is an incredible statement from a justice that that isn't on our side. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it really but is. But it's acknowledging that they have an interest, the state has an interest in protecting this life. And, and they've undervalued it in the past. Right. Um, and, and that's a great point because Justice Kennedy, you know, wasn't one of our friends. He was one of the reasons that the Supreme Court didn't hear appeals 
from those North Dakota cases and the Eighth Circuit cases. I mean, you have to understand, actually the Eighth Circuit said, Roe needs to be revisited. It, it's not very sound. I mean, everybody on the left and right has said Roe is not historically, legally, constitutionally sound, but the Supreme Court doesn't have to hear cases. And when you have the same set of judges who are not on your side up there, you just don't appeal them. So those cases don't bother me. But, but this is a tremendous uh, concession by Justice Kennedy that we've undervalued the state's interest in life, and we need to talk about that. But, but that, that statement reflects what I was going back to. That, that the argument here against this is, is not that if we wait, we'll have better legal arguments. We will have developed a better understanding of, of the history of the Constitution and the understanding of Constitution, or that our understanding of embryology and prenatal development is gonna get better, so we need to wait until we have all of our uh, arrows in the qu quiver or stones in the pouch. Uh, nobody's saying that. They're just saying we just can't win. The giants are too big. But that is an indication the giants are not too big. But there's even more behind it than what you just said. And I think that's what people really need to understand. There's more behind how he made that statement and why it gives us hope for today. Right. And so one of the, one of the, the primary things I think worth talking about is that the, this argument has always been based on, Roe is based on the 14th Amendment. And, right. and if we argue on the 14th Amendment, we all understand that, then we'll, we're arguing on the premise of Roe. And that's what we can't do. That's what we have to get away from. Right. And so SB 1236 that we're, that we're, and the amendments that we're arguing now on Monday, we're, we're basing these arguments off of the Ninth Amendment. That's correct. And so I think it's important that we all understand what that means. And so I, I just, yeah. the Ninth Amendment of the U.S. US Constitution mm -hmm. says, simply says this, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Help us understand why, yeah. why that's an important framework for, for this discussion. Yeah, uh, it really is. The, our whole bill is based on the Ninth Amendment, not the Fourteenth Amendment. So when you hear lawyers say, well, the court's never done this under the 14th Amendment. There's no person who's ever said, no justice who's ever said that, a, that a, the unborn is a person under the 14th Amendment, I would say, okay, we're not arguing the 14th Amendment, we're arguing the Ninth Amendment. Now, now this is where this is important, and I want, I, want to, I want to explain what the Ninth Amendment does and why we grounded this bill in the Ninth Amendment and not the 14th Amendment, is that the federal judicial power is actually exercised by judgments in controversies between two people. So you and I have a controversy over some contract and they enter a judgment. Now you may have that same contract with multiple people, but it doesn't mean in every lawsuit you're gonna lose because the issues could be different, the arguments could be different, there are lots of things that would be different. So the judgment is the actual legal act. That's why in the Federalist Papers they say courts don't exercise force in their will, but judgment. They resolve a particular conflict. Now they do issue opinions, but opinions are not legally operative instruments. Which is the trap we've fallen into yes, here. Yes, that we treat them like they are law. They are reasons for the judgment. Now what's happened is the reasons have been changing over the years. And that's, that's what Kennedy was alluding to a minute ago when you said we've devalued the state's interest. We're rethinking this, mm -hmm. okay? So, so we need to remember, opinions are not the law. They are not addendums to the Constitution. Okay, so we have to look at the Constitution and interpret the Constitution, and we have five justices who say we're supposed to interpret the Constitution, not the opinions about the not Constitution. The so right. put it in a Christian context, it's like saying, oh, I read this commentary by Matthew Henry or, or, or whoever else it might be, and, and the next thing you know, somebody's writing an, a commentary on Matthew Henry's commentary who's writing an opinion on the commentary written on Matthew Henry's commentary, and somebody finally says, well, what does the Bible say? And right. you go... Oh yeah, it's, it's the Bible, isn't it? But that's what we've done in the law. We take an opinion, we make it the law, then somebody has another opinion about that opinion, and the next thing you know, we're way over here and we've forgotten the Constitution. So we said, stop, hold back a minute. Next thing you know, we're at infanticide. Yeah, we're, we're infanticide. We're where the, you know, uh, the governor of Virginia says, well, deliver the baby, uh, put it on the table, have a Coke, you know, take a smoke if need be, and then we'll decide what to do. And bases it on row on, on the right to price. Right. So, so one of the things I said to the committee back in April, is, is when you have a premise that leads to those absurd results that everybody in their mind says, if that's what that leads to, maybe it's time to re-examine the premise. 
And all pro-lifers on both sides of this bill would say, if this premise leads to that, then this premise is stupid. Right. It's horrible. It's bad. But what we've not done is gone directly against that premise, and we've not gone against it with a different kind of argument. That's where the Ninth Amendment comes in. So, so you just read, read, read again, the, the, read that amendment one more time so people get it in their heads. Right, so, so the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people, which, which to me in, in common speak is saying that the, the Constitution lists out rights that we have as a people, but there, there are also rights that we have as individuals that lay outside of the Constitution that the Constitution shall not infringe on. That's right, that's right. This, this is such a fundamental issue, and this is why, whether we win Roe, uh, get Roe versus Wade reversed or not, this bill gives us an opportunity to talk about a much bigger thing. You, you see, at one time in our country, we believed the, what the Declaration of Independence said, that we have certain inalienable rights because they come from the Creator. They lie outside the government. Government is not the source of our rights. So, so there's this big universe, let's say, if I had a blackboard, I'd say, here's this big picture of all the rights that over the course of uh, you know, 1,700 years, we, we decided these are things that are true and they're real. And they're of the nature of law because they're so real, we recognize their force upon us. You just don't kill people, innocent right. people. That's just a true law. And so we pass a civil law. We don't that, need the Constitution to, to know tell that. us that. Yeah. So, but we pass a civil law that conforms to what what they would call the common law. It lies outside. So here's here's this big circle of all the rights in the universe, and the and the Constitution comes along and draws a circle inside of it, and says, now here we're going to enumerate certain rights, and we're going to enumerate this right to life, liberty, and property in the Fourteenth Amendment. It's also in the Fifth Amendment. Okay. Then they passed the Ninth Amendment, and they said, but wait a minute, wait a minute now. We don't want anybody to interpret the Fifth Amendment or the Fourteenth Amendment as if those enumerated rights are the only ones that anybody has because there's this whole big universe out here of rights. And, and so we're not going to sit here and spell them all out. Oh, you have a right to have a yard sale. Oh, you have a right to go to the dentist. Oh, you have a right to eat lunch. We're not going to spell them all out. There are certain things that you have a right to. But there are other rights. They're retained by the people. And the Ninth Amendment says just that. Now, what's important about the, the Ninth Amendment and an understanding of the whole framework is that governments were created, as Locke said, to secure our rights. That's why they exist, not to destroy them, not to abridge them, not to abolish them or undermine them, which is exactly what the Ninth to Amendment To make the said. rights that we already had more secure. That's right. So, so, so what the court has done is they've looked only within the 14th Amendment and they've made up stuff, to be honest. And, and that's not fine, but that's what they've done. But what we've said is we're, we're, we're not going to play that game. That's what the House does. They say, we're going to play within the 14th Amendment set of rules you gave us. Well, that's a losing proposition. Okay? When you accept the other guy's premise... Which would have been challenged by the court and we would have lost. I think so. Yeah. Because then Roe and Casey are definite controlling precedents. Right. I, I, I played the game according to your rules, and you're going to apply your rules. Now, I want to talk about why that, the heartbeat bill is, is, is playing by the rules, maybe, if we get to it. But, but we said, no, 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 we're going to assert a Ninth Amendment, that people, uh, persons, have rights. The common law recognized that. So when you say other rights, well, how do we know what they are and where are they? You can't find them in the Constitution. There's not a list or an index or a, you know, an appendices. Well, our framers understood that our nation and all of our states operated on the basis of this common law, these things that over... From, from Roman law through canon law through, through English jurisprudence and development, we've just dis discerned that people have certain, certain absolute rights that should not be taken away without uh, due process of law. So you have an absolute right to life, the common law said. But now, it's not absolute in the sense that it can't be removed without due process. So you murder somebody, we give you a trial, and we can remove it. But we shouldn't remove it without some due process right. to determine that this exception should apply and you should pay by the death penalty. So, so persons have those rights. The 14th Amendment jurisprudence of Roe said, well, we, we have no clue what a person is. To which the answer is, that's obviously false. If you look at the common law, it knew what a person was. It defined what a person was. So for example, the preeminent uh, expositor of the common law, uh, William Blackstone, who wrote Blackstone's Commentaries on the Laws of English. His, text, his book was the primary textbook for lawyers up until the 1800s after the 14th Amendment was adopted. 
And here's what he says. He says, you have an absolute right to personal security, property, and uh, to um, liberty. He defined then how we understand liberty. It's the ability to move from place to place without being restricted. It did not mean I have the right to go kill a, another human being in the womb or outside the womb. So let's, so let's break here. What we're talking okay. about now is the issue of, What's the of, Ninth Amendment? of personhood. Yes. Be, because the, the Ninth Amendment now hearkens to you know, a law that, that has been around for centuries that, that predates the Constitution. And when the framers wrote the Constitution and they, they set out these laws that protected persons, their understanding of what that person was came from the common law. That was outside the enacted law. Right. That the enacted law should recognize. We didn't define persons in the Constitution because we knew what persons were. Sure. By analogy, uh, up until 1995, we didn't say that only a man and a woman could get a marriage license. We just said the, the parties could get a marriage license. Everybody knew what the parties were. I mean, we didn't have to spell it out. Right. So the point is, the Ninth Amendment says, you cannot take the Fourteenth Amendment's specific enumeration of life, liberty, and property and construe it, I think in those words, to abolish or undermine or abrogate the other rights. So if we can present a bill that says, well, here are these other rights that are now in conflict with these rights, we've now presented a different kind of case or controversy that the Supreme Court has never decided before and on which it's never issued any opinion about how it should be resolved. It's a whole new kind of case. Now that's different from the House bill. That's different from every heartbeat bill in the country that's been passed. So here's what we're doing. We're saying the Ninth Amendment recognizes this. The Ninth Amendment implies that indeed the government, as we all know, is supposed to make more secure the rights that we have. There are other rights than the ones listed in the 14th Amendment. How do we know what they are? They're found in the common law. What does the common law say about it? The most popular expositor of that at the time of the writing of the, uh, um, of the Constitution and the adoption of the 14th Amendment was William Blackstone. And he said in here that one of those rights is to our personal security was the right to life. But then he went on and he said that the child in ventris a mayor, which is a Latin phrase that means in the mother's womb, is treated as a person for purposes of the law in many respects. And he begins to spell out how we, we do that. And he says, so therefore they are persons within the eyes of the law before they are born. Now, the Supreme Court never looked at that. They never considered that. They pretended that it didn't exist. They suppressed the truth and the unrighteousness of trying to reach a political decision. They wanted that a woman had a right to terminate the life of this person inside of her. So we're arguing, we know what's under this Ninth Amendment lid. It's very clear. Everybody knows it. And we're going to ground our bill in that Ninth Amendment. And you can have your Fourteenth Amendment but we're going to now pit the ninth against the 14th, and you've never had to resolve that conflict. You now have to make a decision. You now have to make a decision. Yeah. Is the understanding of person that was protected by the Ninth Amendment the same as this, and are the two in conflict, and can the two be reconciled? These two things, this conflict between these two things has never been in front of the court. Right. And for somebody to say that, that I know how the court's going to answer that, when that issue's never been in front of the court is to have sort of the omniscience of God. And that's an important statement because right now, I would say that, that the court is rethinking the way they think about persons. You had mentioned sure. in a conversation, you've got the Sixth Circuit right now that has been involved in these heartbeat bills in Ohio and in Kentucky, and they're, they're using some language mm -hmm. that would point to the fact that they are rethinking how we approach this issue of personhood in the unborn. Sure, and those are some of the breadcrumbs you mentioned earlier. What are right. the indications we have that, that now might be the time? But the Sixth Circuit, for instance, didn't come up with these breadcrumbs on their own. I mean, in the Sixth Circuit opinion that came out this spring upholding Kentucky's ultrasound law, they referred to the child, the unborn child, the preborn child, uh, 37 times, I think it was, in the first 17 pages. They're recognizing that we know this. And they're recognizing that we know this because of the way we treat the unborn in every other area of law. Criminal law, I mean, our fetal homicide laws are irreconcilable with the understanding of abortion. In, in abortion, a third party, a doctor, kills the unborn in the womb. In a fetal homicide situation, a third party kills the unborn in the woman's womb. For one, it's a crime, and for the other, it's not. How do you reconcile that? How do you have a rule of law that says this is our understanding of the person 
and our understanding of pregnancy, and the rule of law says that law should be so universal that it can apply in every circumstance. And the Supreme Court said, well, we're just gonna be arbitrary and we're gonna pull abortion out of that and treat it as an anomaly. At some point, the court has to be confronted with the anomaly. That's not what the House bill does. Right. That is what the Senate bill does. So, so what are these breadcrumbs? Well, the, the, the first one is, and we have to appreciate this, that, that Roe weighed the interest of the state and the interest of the woman in having an abortion. They said, well, we don't know when life begins. We don't know what a person is. So that kind of frees us up to only really focus on the woman. And so the state's interest kind of kicks in at some point because it potentially becomes a person. You know, if it's born, it'll be a person. If it survives outside the womb, it becomes a person. Right. So Rose said, but, you know, the woman's right ought to be unfettered during the first trimester. During the second trimester, you can pass bills to protect the health of the mother. And only in the third trimester can you actually protect the, the, the unborn child. Uh, only then does the state's interest in protecting life become compelling. Well, <clears throat> what's fascinating is that in 1983, Justice O'Connor wrote an opinion. And she said, this understanding of viability that's based really nothing more than a subjective prognosis. You know, what, what are the odds that, that you're gonna make it to be, into being a person someday? She what are said, the odds that I'll be alive tomorrow? Well, I don't know, <laughs> but can I determine if you're viable today? Today you're living, yeah. so, so you're viable. Now you may have cancer and your prognosis is not very good, but objectively you are alive. And the court said, we're gonna reject the, the objective understanding that we've diagnosed the existence of a life in a pregnancy, and we're gonna instead talk about what are the odds that, that that unborn child will actually become a person in the eyes of the law. Now, that sounds a little complicated, but they picked a point, and they said, well, your state doesn't really have any interest until the third trimester. In 1983, the court ruled some other laws were unenforceable, and Justice O'Connor wrote an opinion, and she said, you know, this is arbitrary, this notion of viability out here. She said, you know, why not pick any point? If you're not gonna pick conception, what's the difference between one point on this line and any other point on this line? The law should not be arbitrary. That's contrary to the rule of law. Which is what the House bill Which is did. what the House bill does. It, it says we don't really care if you're a person, we just care when there's a heartbeat. Well, that's subjective and it's based on, well, once there's a heartbeat, the odds of you living to become a person are better. But see, that's accepting the Casey premise. I reject the Casey premise and the Roe premise. This bill says, no, when we detect that there's a life, the state's interest kicks in, and it kicks in because of the Ninth Amendment, not because of the 14th Amendment. Right. But, but, but O'Connor wrote that. She that's, said, this is, this is all arbitrary. That's the key. That's the key. Right She's saying this is all arbitrary. So then we come to the Casey decision. Now, what's fascinating about Casey is five justices agreed on the judgment that we should enjoin these laws, but five could not agree on the reason why. It's kind of like you and, you, you and I sitting here saying we should have a coffee break, uh, we need coffee, and I think we need it because I'm nervous or you're nervous or you think you need it because you're going to sleep, and we have all different kinds of reasons for why we have a coffee break. So they agreed we're gonna enjoin these laws, but we can't agree why. That's what opinions are, they're just the why, they're not the law, okay? So O'Connor wrote an opinion with Kennedy and Justice Souter that Blackman, who wrote Roe, and Stevens would not join in. Now, what was, what was so bad about that part of that opinion? Like I say, they couldn't agree on the reasons. We agree on the result. We can't agree on the reason. Here's what Connor wrote. She picked up on what she said in 1983. And she said, we wrote in, in Roe that the state has an interest in life. But if we arbitrarily pick the third trimester for when it kicks in, that makes no sense. That's arbitrary. And, and really, the state's interest in potential life is from conception. How do, how, do you, how do you pick one arbitrary place over another? Now, that's a huge statement by her. Big. Yes. So then what happens when we get to the Gonzalez case where, where um, I don't remember what you read now, but, but it was Kennedy making a profound con well, he, concession. Well, he, he was saying that what, what the, was the court saying? had uh, for so long undervalued the, the state's, state's interest yes. in protecting potential life. Yeah. See, so that's why he joined with what O'Connor was saying. This is all arbitrary. If you don't go to the objective point of, of a life exists and therefore we can declare it to be a person and give it due process and decide whether it lives or dies, it just dies, you know, Roe, then we've undervalued the state's interest and Gonzalez picks that up. And Kennedy writes the majority opinion there, you see. 
So he's following through with Casey that's saying, we've undervalued the state's interest. You didn't really attack Roe and Casey. You left us to presume it was okay, and after 20 years, we're not gonna fight it if you're not gonna make us fight it. Now we come to Gonzalez, which was the partial birth abortion case that upheld the federal partial birth abortion law. And he says, yep, we have undervalued the state's interest in life, okay? Now there were five justices that signed that opinion, but what he said in that opinion was very, very telling. He said, though there are five people who support the opinion, not all those who join in this opinion support the reasons for it that Roe is still good, so we're going to presume that Roe and Casey are good law. Hmm. Now, why, when the court is telling you, we've got, we, can't, we cannot still agree on all the reasons, so we're just gonna assume something, why wouldn't you go attack the assumption? Okay, why, why wouldn't right. you, right, okay? Especially when Kennedy, who's writing that, is now not on the court. And you have a Justice Kavanaugh who says, we need to look at what the original Constitution says. Now, now here's, here's where I think we have a bad strategy with the House version of the bill. If you're going to continue picking some arbitrary point, rather than the objective point that says, look, if, if the, uh, the hormonal levels of HGC don't indicate that there's a person here, or excuse me, indicates there's a person or a heartbeat. And sometimes those things come at different points. The House bill ignores the possibility that we may know a life exists prior to the heartbeat. That's right. why it's called the heartbeat bill. Well, and if you keep picking an arbitrary point, you haven't changed the argument. Yeah, that's right. So, so therefore, what you've done is you've gone to a guy like Roberts who gets squeamish about the court looking like we're just playing politics, and you're saying, all you're telling me is you think your arbitrary point is better than my arbitrary point, and that looks like politics. Oh, I've written some strong stuff saying Roe is horrible, but doggone it, you keep arguing Casey and Roe. And then you got Kavanaugh who says, I can't come on this court and sit here and say, you know, this is precedent and blah, 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 the 14th Amendment, and now all this changing is you're wanting me to just switch arbitrary point to an arbitrary point. No, you better give him something better than that. That's why I didn't like the House bill. So he said, we're gonna give you something better than that. The Constitution through the Ninth Amendment anticipates that states will do their primary function, secure the rights we have. The Ninth Amendment says we have other rights than those enumerated in the 14th Amendment. And we're saying, great, we're gonna, we're gonna glom onto that. And we're gonna say, so what are those other rights? Well, we know what they are because the common law articulated them for them. They included the child in the womb. And every other part of the law, criminal property tort, recognizes the unborn as a person except for abortion. And it's time to say, get your act together, create a consistent rule of law, stop being arbitrary, and go for the jugular because we, we've assumed stuff in Casey, we assume stuff in Gonzalez. Now, I wanna mention, a good lawyer never fails to mention the argument from the other side. So there was a case in 2016 called uh, Whole Women's Health Center versus Hellerstadt. Five justices enjoined the enforcement of certain pro-life laws. It was a chance that the court could have reversed Roe, but they didn't. And uh, but what's interesting in that case is that they had to deal with Gonzalez. I mean, you can't just pretend the, that, that- The partial that, birth abortion yeah, bill. Yeah, the partial birth abortion yeah. bill. Uh, how, do we, how do we deal with that? How do, we, how do we deal with this case that's now on our side, uh, against our side? So what's interesting is, is the courts referenced Gonzalez and said, well, in Gonzalez, the legislature made specific findings supporting their legislation. They didn't do that in Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstadt. They just passed the bill. Now that's interesting because the House bill has no whereas clauses and no findings of anything. They've fallen into the very trap of women's whole health versus Hellerstadt. They didn't say, here's why we are doing this. And then the court in Hellerstadt said, because you didn't, like in Gonzales, spell out what you were doing, we're left to infer to assume you're trying to do something constitutional that is a constitutional objective. Mm. Well, that's what I told the House members before they ever passed the bill. If you don't put in whereas clauses explaining what you're doing, you're gonna, get, you're gonna ha let them to assume whatever they want. They didn't give a new premise. They didn't give a new premise. They didn't even give the old premise. They didn't give any premise. They just left the court free to infer whatever they wanted to infer, and that is not wise. And that's why I wouldn't support the bill. They're arguing on those terms, and yet they don't even spell out why. They're not even spelling out in that bill in a whereas clause, 
our odds of determining viability are better than your odds of determining viability. Hmm. So, so that's just a horrible bill. But the Senate bill says, no, 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 we're, we're not accepting this. What are the odds concept somewhere between here and there? We're saying we have an objective basis to determine that a life exists, the science is there, we know it, and if we use that objective basis, we can apply that understanding as a rule of law that makes all of the law, property, tort, criminal, and abortion consistent and uniform and not contradictory with some anachronistic anomaly over here of abortion that doesn't fit into anything else. So we spelled out in like 37 whereas clauses. Here's exactly what we're doing. And here's exactly what the Ninth Amendment says. And here's exactly what Blackstone says. And we are doing what Blackstone and the common law and the Ninth Amendment expressly envisioned legislative bodies doing. Mm. Asserting the right to life that exists in the unborn. To protect and, persons, all that, persons. That's right. And so for the first time since 1973, 46 years, we're going to attack the underlying premise of Roe that everyone on the left and right has said is horrible. But rather than pussyfoot around it, nibble at the edges and hope that they'll take our hint and reverse, we're gonna say, we're gonna make you decide. They've made it obvious they won't take our hint. They've made, they've made it obvious we won't take our hint, so why keep hinting? Right. Just go for it. Throw the rock at the giant. You've given us these little breadcrumbs all along the way. Now, now I wanna go back to one other thing in Gonzales because it's important that in the Hellerstadt case, like I say, they didn't try to distinguish the reasoning of the Gonzalez case, the partial birth abortion case. They just said, well, you didn't give us any findings and we're left over here in the woman's case to infer what you're trying to do. Well, that's a great way to always lose. You know, if you, if you don't make your, your premise clear, then somebody's gonna presume whatever they want to get to their conclusion. But here's what, here's what Ginsburg said in her dissent in Gonzalez. And this is very telling because it's the other side explaining what the majority was doing in Gonzales, and she was horrified. She said, the line used to be viability, whether or not the odds were you could make it outside the womb. And she says, the, the court has blurred that line. Hmm. And, and they have blurred the line, yeah. because Kennedy was saying back with O'Connor in 80, 80 O'Connor in 83, 83, and then him in 1992, that that this makes no sense. Why are we picking some arbitrary point along the line here from conception to birth? And, and she said, so, so you've really blurred that line. She said, worse than that, you've now referred to moral and ethical reasons the state might justify a bill. We've never looked at the morality and ethics of abortion. You've now made that a consideration. Wonderful, I say. Yep. Then she said, not only that, but you refer to the physicians and the obstetricians, not by their proper titles, but as abortion doctors. You refer to living human beings, which is of course exactly what the Sixth Circuit picked up and the Eighth Circuit picked right, up. in their language. Yeah, they're saying, hey, the Supreme Court's already referred to you as an independent separate from the mother living human being. Here's sort of the timeline. Uh, 73 in a row, we get this artificial trimester basis and say the state has no interest till the third trimester. In 83, O'Connor writes a dissent and she said, this is crazy. We've picked this arbitrary notion of prognostic viability. What are the odds you're gonna make it to personhood? And why is one point any better than the other? Finally, in 1992, nine years later, she gets to write an opinion that says to Blackman and all the people that supported Roe, this makes no sense. Roe is in conflict with itself because it says the state has an interest in potential life, but yet doesn't let it assert it until the third trimester. She says, this is all arbitrary, as I said in 1983. The interest of the state begins at conception. Well, that horrified Blackman. No wonder he wouldn't join that opinion. Hmm. And then comes Gonzalez in 2007, and the Supreme Court picks it up and says, we don't care whether you're viable or not. That's, what Black, that's exactly what Ginsburg said. You've blurred the line, and you've made no distinction between viability and unviability. You've injected moral concerns. You had a chance today in Gonzalez to reaffirm Roe and Casey, and you didn't. You presumed it. Oh, she's hot. For decades, the justices have discussed with each other that they have built a faulty premise. That's right. right. And because <laughs> nobody's blown on the foundation, you know, like the, whatever, the story of the three little pigs, you know, and the fox, he huffed and puffed. We've not huffed and puffed on the foundations. 
So along comes the women's health case while we're still nibbling around. And, and, and they, get, they get five people together. But what's interesting, as I said, those five did not say Gonzalez was wrong in adding moral concerns. They did not say Gonzalez was wrong and, 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 and Kennedy and before him, O'Connor were wrong in saying the state's interest uh, extends throughout the period of pregnancy. They didn't say in, in the woman's health case, Hellerstedt, they didn't say that when Gonzalez blurred the line that it actually didn't blur the line. You didn't really explain anything in here. You didn't give us any whereas clauses. You didn't give us any, so we're just having to presume that, that you had a good intent and we're just not gonna presume that. So, so the Senate bill says, no, we do have a good intent. It's rooted in the Ninth Amendment. You've never decided a conflict between the Ninth and the Fourteenth Amendment. This is a new case or controversy. And so all of your cases about the 14th Amendment are not conclusory and binding on a case that involves the Ninth Amendment. And that's why I think this is a good strategy. The court has indicated where it's going. Their, their decisions are, are incoherent and inconsistent and arbitrary, and they know it, and yet nobody's pushed on them. The science is now making it very uncomfortable for them. And so now it's time to huff and puff and blow the house down. That's what the Senate version of the bill does. And I keep asking myself as people say the argument that, you know, now's not the time. I, I look at all these things that we've discussed and I, I look at the science. You know, we can literally watch a baby in the womb today yeah. suck his thumb and play with their toes. Yeah. And I ask myself, well, if not now, when? Yeah. When? When is the right time? Yeah. yeah, it's not as if the science isn't on our side. And it's not as if the law is not really on our side. The law's always been on our side. We, ju we just have been afraid to use it. And, and, and I get what the other side has said. And, and this is very important about opinions. They are not the law. But when, when five people tell me, here's how I understand the law, what's the point of the next year going back to them and saying, well, you're wrong? The odds are they're, gonna, they're not gonna admit they made a mistake. So typically you do give great weight and deference to, to opinions, to their reasons, until such time as either history or new evidence or science or something comes up to show, wait a minute, th this, this was really wrong, this wasn't right. Or, or, or maybe the composition of the court changes. But that is exactly what's been happening over the last 46 years, that all those things have been changes, but we, we, changing, but we've been afraid to just assert them and go for it. Right. And, and that's where I think, as you say, if not now, then when? Hmm. Thank you, David, for your, sure. your time. I, you know, I really hope that for those of you that might be on the fence, um, you know, I think when we say we're pro-life, we all want the same thing. Sure. You know, and, and there's, there should be no animosity between those who have different strategies, but I, I hope that in hearing this argument, um, that you will call your legislators and, and any, anyone in the Senate watching this video, I, I hope that you will pass this bill because uh, now, now is the time. And uh, I, I really believe that, not to my knowledge, we've ever had an argument this strong um, to go and attack the, the faulty premise that we discussed here today. So um, thanks, David. Yeah, thanks for everybody for listening. Yeah.